welcome. I'm, I'm John Mead, and I want to thank you from A16, by the way, and I want to thank everyone for, for being here. Um, we, this is going to be fun tonight to learn a bit about Anza Borrego. Uh, we have tonight uh, here is uh, Sam Young, Samantha Young. Mm -hmm. Sam, you, you call her Sam. Um, and she's going to talk to us in a few minutes. But what I thought I would do first is actually want to thank um, our host, Helix Brewing. Rob over here is from Helix Brewing, and want to thank you. He's a... It was actually uh, his boss, Cameron, who is the owner of, of Helix, that uh, came up with the idea a few years ago to let's do Wild Wednesdays because uh, Helix, as you might remember, used to provide the beer at the, the store when we, we had the, the, uh, the presentations there. So uh, thank you for having us here tonight, Rob and the, and the team here at Helix Brewing. So about four years ago, we, we closed down the, the company. All of our stores were, were closed. And uh, my wife's here, and she can tell you that uh, about six months into it, I thought, uh, Cindy's over here. Um, so I, 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 she needed to kind of get me out of the house, and uh, I was looking for ways to, you know, to stay busy. And uh, I'd spent 40 years uh, at A16. There's a lot of A16 alumni here tonight. There's too many to, 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 to start naming, but uh, I, I really missed it. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a way that we can kind of keep the spirit alive, keep the embers burning a little bit. Uh, and uh, continue to do part of what we did was to inspire and educate people on how to use the outdoors uh, responsibly and, and uh, inspire inspire folks. Uh, we have a lady here tonight that I won't embarrass you too much, but came to the last oh, week's yeah. presentation, <laughs> and uh, you know she was looking for ways to get motivated to hike. And the gal that was here talked about how she made a goal at 60 to do 60 hikes and ended up doing 180 and, and all and gave a presentation, wrote a book, all that. And then she went home, decided that now you're turning 50 and so she's going to do 50 yeah, hikes yeah, right. uh, this coming year. So anyway, that's what it's all about. It's about in inspiring people. So we're going to learn tonight about a place that uh, is uh, one of our, it's so close to have Anza Borrego State Park so close to us and it's, it's just a magnificent uh, park and uh but but there's a lot of unknowns about about anza borrego and how to use it well you know right and, and where to go and and what to do and so tonight we got an expert talking about about that we have people tonight from the state parks raise your hands here we got like at least three of you guys so thanks for the work that you do um with the state parks and they are on i know these two are on the education side of of things and what 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 Carl is your what do you I'm an architect. on the architectural side? Yeah, so all the big buildings that are part of the state. No, yeah, yeah, there are. Yeah. So yeah, this, uh, I'm sure that's a very busy busy job. Um, anyway, thank you guys for for what you do there. The Anza Borrego Foundation, and I won't go into detail about it, what it is, but A16 has had a long history and, and the relationship with the foundation. And they've done amazing things o over the years, and we've been proud to, to help amplify, you know, what it is that they do for the last, you know, uh, I don't know, since they started, which I think was at least 35, 40 years ago. Um, so we're proud of that. We're proud to have you here tonight, Sam, and delighted to have you here. And you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, exploring Anza Borrego State Park yes. and about the foundation too. Yep. Great, Thanks. Sam. Thank you. So today, today's presentation is kind of a, a hodgepodge of a bunch of different things about Anza Borrego, about the state park itself, ecology, uh, what it does, what the foundation does, um, where to go, what you can see when you go to the park. And um, I, I was talking to a few people just uh, in, the, in the meet and greet, meet and drink. Um, and so I, I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of experience in Anza Borrego already. And so I'm, I am not an expert, despite what John said. Um, I've been going to Anza Brego, uh, for maybe 20 years, off and on, since college. Um, and then I've, I've worked for the foundation for a little over a year. Um, but, it, but again, not an expert. And uh, so, yeah, I'll get started. Um, this is... This, I thought I'd start with this fun picture. So this is from one of my very first trips to Anza Borrego in college. And um, that's me in one of the mud caves. Uh, and uh, uh, the trips that I used to go on were with a bunch of ladies. And we would go on these adventures where um, uh, my best friend in college grew up going to Anza Borrego. And so she was the one that showed me the ropes, which 
I, I've learned um, over this last year is how most people become really familiar with Anza Borrego, right? It's fairly, it's fairly intimidating to go on your own without someone else who knows what they're doing. And so she taught me how to adventure in the desert. And I have some of my best memories of my life from being in this desert. Um, so I am the education manager for the foundation, which supports the state park. And I'll go into details about what each of us do separately. The Anzabrego Desert is part of the Sonoran Desert, which is one of four major deserts in North America. So there's the Great Basin Desert, the Mojave Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, and the Sonoran Desert that cover uh, different areas within uh, the West, Western United States. And um, Anzabrego is a portion of the Sonoran Desert that also extends further east farther I'm east of I've us and way. south into Mexico. Um, and go, really, go. it's incredibly variable because it, it sits at an elevation from sea level all the way up to around 62 or 6,500 feet, depending on um, what, where you read. Um, so it includes not only the Brego Basin and like very low level basin, but also um, into the mountains the, uh, I believe the Santa Rosa Mountains, right? And San Isidro Mountains. Um, it's the largest state park in California, which I feel like probably most of you know that, uh, by far. So I've heard, this, I've heard the um, comparison that just about all of the other state parks in California could fit inside of Anza Borrego Desert State Park. <laughs> yeah, so, so it is by far the largest and um, it's, it's classified as a state park, which, which traditionally has um, less prestige than a national park. But I've heard a lot of people say that it has the level of resources that a national park has without the level of visitors, right? without the um, crowds that you get. So it encompasses about 70% of California state wilderness. So California state wilderness is a specific designation that uh, that refers to very wild places, things that are undisturbed, untouched by man. Uh, so in Anza Brego Desert State Park is 70% of what California has throughout the entire state of state wilderness. Um, and, then, and then also, just in case you're wondering where the name comes from, it's named after uh, Juan Batista de Anza, who was uh, the Spanish explorer in the 1800s who um, made this area famous and also created, was part of the creation of the Anza Trail, which runs throughout the park. And then also Borrego, which is the Spanish word for sheep, lamb. Um, and the name has gone through different iterations as the park was being created, but eventually uh, they settled on both of these names, kind of honoring two pieces of its history. So, uh, Let's talk about the desert now, the desert itself. Um, so I don't know if you guys can read this. Can you read this? Yeah. So this is, this is on a plaque in, at the San Diego and Imperial County border. Um, it says, this is the desert. There's nothing out there, nothing. And I, I like this, because that is what a lot of people, most people think if they haven't spent time exploring or learning about it. Um, it, can, it can look and seem really desolate, like there's nothing there. But um, I think I'm speaking to the choir when I say that's, that's just not true, right? right? There's, there is a lot out there, incredible diversity of life, um, of life, of geology, of archaeological important sites, paleontology, all of these things. Um, so the desert is full of life. And so here's a, a little call back to one of its most popular attractions, which are the wildflowers, um, which did anyone go out to see the wildflowers last spring? It was it was an incredible year for wildflowers, right? Is we no one was officially calling it a super bloom. And I, I asked around a little bit to like important official people, like including the environmental scientists of the state park. Who decides when it's a super bloom, right? Who gives it that name, super bloom? And the scientists didn't know. They don't do that. They don't give it that name. 
it's probably just the news outlets and <laughs> that decide it's a super bloom or the tourists. But I, w I would say that it, it certainly felt like a super bloom last year. Um, but the wildflowers are one of the most popular attractions um, because they're, they're obvious and they're beautiful. It's really neat to see something like that in the desert, which people would think is otherwise desolate. And the, it depends on rain, um, but not rain, you know, a month before. It actually depends on summer rain and then the rain in the fall and then the temperature levels as you proceed into the fall and the winter. And then spring is when you have these if you have a good rain and not too hot temperatures, you have these incredible blooms of wildflowers. And I believe, I believe this is Henderson Canyon. Someone was asking me where is the best place to see wildflowers. And it depends, on, it depends from year to year, so I don't know where is going to be the best place this spring if there is going to be a good place. Um, but Henderson Canyon is fairly, is, um, is solidly always a pretty good place to see wildflowers. Yeah. So um, what makes the desert? I'm going to give you a little ecology lesson here so, uh, because this is my, my background is in biology and biological anthropology. So I'm, I, I really like learning about and talking about the uh, why life and what makes life exist. And not, not very, I'm not very good at details, and I'm not really great at identifying specific plants and animals or birds, um, even though I like looking at them. I'm, I'm better at the big picture. So I studied evolutionary biology, and I like, I like understanding the big picture and, and asking questions. Uh, but so let's talk a little bit about ecology and what makes a desert. So I'm going to throw it out to you all. What makes a desert? <laughs> yeah, low water. Temperature, what kind of temperature? High, High, but also low. So temperature extremes, right? You can have really low. Yeah, moisture. So low moisture, or rather, rather you sometimes get a lot of moisture all at once, uh, but it doesn't stick around. So we call that low levels of evapotrans evapotranspiration. Yeah, so specifically this desert is created because it's surrounded by mountain ranges on almost all sides. And so why would the mountain ranges create this desert? Yeah, the shadow, a rain shadow effect. And so I have I actually have a little video. I didn't test the sound, so we'll, we'll hope that that works. But I have a little video that shows what the rain shadow effect is all about. What? So yes, um, sand or gravel it typically is, is a prominent feature because wind is a big feature. So wind, why would wind be related to sand? So wind increases evaporation, but it also increases erosion, where you have the wind removing particles from rocks and other types of um, forming inanimate objects that then creates sand and creates dunes and creates um, what we call the desert pavement, which are these flat surfaces. So I'll just put my, I have a list here. Let's see, did you guys get them all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just about, just about. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about soil. So the fragile, salt, shallow, salty soils um, make it so that the water, the moisture, doesn't stick around. So even if there is rain, it doesn't stay, it doesn't stick around. And then that also leads to flash floods because when there's rain, it, it's not absorbed very well by the soil. And so it can come a lot all at once and then it sort of rushes through a canyon or a wash creating a flash flood. All right, anything else I wanna know? Okay, so Anzabrego Desert specifically is created by a rain shadow effect and not all deserts are created by a rain shadow effect. Um, yeah. But that, that is what this one is created by. And the, the video I have is not Anzabrego, but you can just pretend it's the same format. It's a similar setup where you have coast and then a coastal mountain range. And then on the other side of that is the desert, which is what we have. Um, so what we have here is the Pacific Ocean and then um, the mountains, the coastal range of mountains, right? So if you've been to um, 
Cuyamaca or, Lagu or uh, the Laguna Mountains or Palomar, you've been in these mountains that are responsible for that rain shadow effect, which collect all the moisture in the air. And then as the air continues up and over the mountain range, actually this way, um, there's, there's very little moisture left. Right? And so you have this really dry, hot air that remains. And that's what the desert receives. And so it's not to say the desert does not get rain. Has anyone ever been in Anzabrego when it does rain? Yeah. And, and sometimes it can be really, really intense. And that along with wind. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's not, we, we calculate it on an annual basis. And so deserts are traditionally characterized as getting under 10 inches of rain in a, a year, in a single year. Um, so yes, there is, there is two aquifers that exist within that region in Borrego, um, uh, within the district, right? So it includes Anza Borrego and surrounding areas. And the aquifers are essentially underground sources of water that have collected over the years. It stays there for a time, and then it gets used up by people, by the ecosystem, but then it also gets refilled by rain and other types of precipitation. Um, and so um, interesting, interestingly, it's a hot topic right now because recently uh, there was an act passed called the Groundwater Sustainability Act in California, which highlighted several zones in California that have regions of priority that are being overdrafted, which means their groundwater, their aquifers are being used up faster than they're being refilled naturally by the ecosystem, which is a problem. Why? Okay. Yeah, because eventually you're going to run out of water. There's going to be nothing left and no one will have water. The ecosystem won't have water and the people who live in this region won't have water if we, if we keep overdrafting, using more than is refilled. So the Groundwater Sustainability Act puts a limit that in, in 17, or at, and now I think we're at 15 years, um, the Borrego Valley, that region, has to reduce its water consumption by 70%. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's primarily being used by uh, golf courses and farms. Right, and agricultural fields, along with the communities that live there. You can look online um, to look for the priority regions for the Groundwater Sustainability Act, and you can find a lot of that online, a lot of those details. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the resources, going back to the ecology. So the, the, this is a very small sampling of, of some of the incredible things that we have in Anzabrego Desert State Park. Uh, so first one I have here is that the state park, like I mentioned, it's the largest state park in California at 650,000 acres. Um, and then if you, this is just the state park. If you include the surrounding areas, it bumps that number up to potentially, um, you know, almost a million acres in this region. It's an international dark sky park, so, which means that it's a great place to see stars. It's one of the best places in California to see stars. I believe that last I checked, it was the only international dark sky park in California. And it has to do with the levels of light pollution that, that, uh, cont that um, I don't want to say contaminate, but basically that pollute the darkness, right? Light, we don't often think of light as a pollutant, but it is, right, because it's not human-made uh, light is not a natural part of an ecosystem. And so in the, in the nights, it corrupts what would be a natural dark landscape. So if you haven't been out there to see the night sky, particularly during a new moon, um, because a full moon is also beautiful, it's so bright, but you can't see the stars as well. The new moon is really the time to come out and see stars and look at the night sky. We also have incredible geology. Uh, so um, he, he, there's a small, a small image. I have, I have a couple other pictures to show you some of the really cool geological formations. But that is, even if you're not interested in animals or plants, just go to see the geology. Like, just go look at some rocks. And you don't even need to know what they are, but you just drive around and you see these crazy formations um, that 
look and feel like you're on another planet. Um, archaeology and paleontology are incredible in this region. So we have a dedicated staff of archaeologists and a dedicated paleontologist, which, by the way, it's the only, I believe it's the only state park in California that has a paleontologist on staff. And the reason for that is because there is a near complete fossil record of the Pleistocene era that they've uncovered and are still uncovering to this day. So um, there's, a, there's a, um, a really great volunteer program that trains paleontologists to go out and uh, monitor and search for fossils. And there's a really beautiful lab that has a lot of these fossils stored up. Um, and then of course, flora. So beautiful plants, gorgeous plants. Um, many, many rare and endangered species. Uh, there's also a botany lab that hosts a collection of uh, what we call an herbarium. So an herbarium is a, a library of plants. And it has somewhere around 7,000 species cataloged in that herbarium. And then fauna, of course, the animals. And shown here is the endangered desert bighorn sheep, which, uh, you, which the population is, sits at around between 250 and 300, I believe. And most of it, most of this endangered species is in Anza Borrego Desert State Park. So moving on. Also, I just want to mention it's a part of, it's in a UNESCO World Heritage Site as it's part of the Mojave and Colorado Desert Biosphere Reserve. So not just Anza Borrego, but it's part of the larger reserve that includes Death Valley and Joshua Tree. So um, I, always, I always like to share that because many people have heard of Death Valley and Joshua Tree. Not many people have heard of Anza Borrego, but it is, it is as important and as cool as those two places. And then it's also the traditional homeland of uh, two major groups of San Diego Native Americans, the Kumeyaay and the Kawea. Um, and so there are many places in the park where you can see evidence of these people who utilized this land for thousands and thousands of years. So we have records going back about 10,000 years uh, that shows that they used the desert as a wintering ground, that they spent more than six months of their time living and living off of the land in this region. So this region that supposedly has nothing but actually has incredible food resources and shelter. So what, so okay, switching gears a little bit, I wanna talk about the foundation. So I don't work for the park, I work for the Anza Borrego Foundation. We are officially the cooperating association with Anza Borrego Desert State Park, which just means that we have a contract. We, we signed a piece of paper and it's very official. And we support the state park in, in many different ways. Um, some of it is financially, some of it is with land, and some of it is with education. Um, but everything that we do ultimately exists to support the state park, to go back to the state park. So. Our, this is our mission. I'm not going to read out loud, but feel free to read that. Um, but we do three major things. One is land acquisition. And we originally started 55 years ago as essentially a land trust. So a small committee that would buy up land that was privately owned, but sat within the boundaries of Anza Borrego Desert State Park. We would buy that land and then eventually donate it to the state park to, in, to complete the puzzle making the park more and more whole. And we have been doing that for 55 years and we're still doing that, but we have purchased almost 70,000 acres and there's only about 14,000 more to go of private land to donate to the state park, which means that eventually we're gonna run out of land to buy and we won't have that as one of our main priorities. And so um, in addition to direct to park support like uh, financial investments and um, grant making and things like that. We also run education programs. So that is really where we're taking the organization, where we're placing a lot of our priorities these days. In the last 20 years, we've really been growing education programs. And that's where I come in. So I joined about a year ago. Um, I, was, I wasn't the first education manager, um, but I, I was brought in after a strategic planning process that really clarified where we wanted our education programs to go. Um, oh, here, I just wanted to show you what that looked like. So uh, like I mentioned, we add land to the state park. So in 
this is this is not the most updated image, but this is what I had on hand. So don't don't take it at its word. Um, but just to give you an idea, in tan, in the tan color is the state park, and then the purple is private in holding. So these are privately owned parcels of land that we only buy from willing sellers, and we get it appraised so that we know the value and they get fair value. Um, we buy it up and then we donate it to the park. Um, Yes, yeah, so all sellers know that, that we are buying it for the state park. And, and it doesn't always happen very quickly. Sometimes we have to sit on that land for many, many years simply because there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of steps to actually donating it to, donating it to the state. But it, in essence, it's managed as part of the state park even if we own it and the state doesn't yet. Um, another thing that we, is really important, we don't spend a lot of time on, but it's, it's really a big priority of ours, is monitoring renewable energy projects and advocating for smart planning. And I just wanted to throw this in there because um, renewable energy is, is a really sexy topic right now. And you know everyone wants to build a solar farm or a wind farm, which is great. However, everyone wants to put it in the desert where there's nothing, right? <laughs> And um, these, this is an image from a few years ago of, of uh, proposed, some proposed solar farms that would be um, right on the edge of the state park. And in reality, these aren't a lot of them, not everything, not all of them, but many of them are not, are not well thought out or they don't, they don't take into consideration the ecosystem uh, and, the act and the communities that live there. So there's a very thriving community. So what you see Right here in the center up there is the community of Borrego Springs, which is a thriving community of people who live in the, are surrounded by State Park and would be directly affected by these things and don't actually wish for a lot of these things to come in. Just wanted to mention that. Um, also, we have um, a really healthy partnership with UC Irvine, Steel Bernand, and Zabrego Desert Research Center, which is a mouthful. Um, but it, it, there is a really cool research center just on the outskirts of Borrego Springs that also includes a 70,000 acre biodiversity reserve that is managed by UC Irvine. And so we, we have access to that space, to the research center, to the biodiversity reserve, and we host many of our programs there. Um, we also work together to conduct research and to get the word out about research. Um, so we, we, there is also a, uh, a staff of environmental scientists run by the state park. So they work for California State Parks and they are responsible for conducting research in and around Anza Borrego and Palomar and Cuyamaca State Park. So three state parks that are all part of the Colorado Desert District, um, which is all managed together. And they, the, the the reason that they exist is so that they can un understand the landscape and the ecosystem to then create management priorities, right? To be able to manage it and protect it in the smartest way possible. Um, I already mentioned the paleontology and archaeology labs. And then this is a really cool thing that I just wanted to announce and put out there. It's not ready yet, but Anza Borrego Foundation is putting out our first ever research magazine called The Desert Researcher that's going to be released, not November, but it's actually January 1st now. And in it, we're going to, we summarize all of the research that has happened over the past year in the state park from, directly from the scientists and also researchers working in, from other organizations in Anza Borrego. And it's exciting. You guys don't seem that excited, but I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited about it because there, there's nothing of this kind out there and it's almost, not, not to say anyone's trying to hide anything, because no one's hiding, hiding anything on purpose. It's just the state park is, is, doesn't have a lot of capacity to put this information out there. And so we have taken it upon ourselves to put this information out there. And so we're really, really excited about this initiative. And it's going to be available to anyone. All you have to do is sign up. Like, tell us who you are so we know who's reading our magazine. Um, and then you can, you can read this. And we're going to do it every year. Um, so if you're not already sold on the park, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little vignette of what is so great about Anza Brego Desert State Park. OK, ready? 
Um, so, and, and also I just want to say that all of these images, or most of these images that I have up here, come from submissions to our photo contest, which we run every year, and has just opened today. So if you're a photographer and you don't have to have any fancy special equipment, you can use a cell phone, uh, we invite you to submit a photo to our photo contest that then gets put on, winners get chosen by a panel of judge, judges in Borrego Springs and then get, get um, displayed at the Borrego Art Institute in Borrego Springs. Okay, so first we have prickly plant, plants thriving in the arid desert climate. Does anyone know what these plants, what one of these plants are, the most prominent one? Yeah, these are choya. I believe these are teddy bear choya. And I, don't they look so cuddly? <laughs> Um, does it, who here has had an experience with a choya? <laughs> who hasn't? Yeah. Um, so choya are one of the most prominent plants that we have in Anza Brego. And in fact, it's one of the iconic species. So you don't find choya in the other deserts, in many other deserts or other districts. You don't have choya. Um, or Choya is fairly unique. It's not exclusive, but it's fairly unique to Anza Brego. And we have several different species. And I say if you have not had an experience with a Choya, the reason is because they have these uh, inverted barbs that when you get a spine in your body or even in your shoe and then you go to pick it out with your fingers, it just gets stuck even further. And then you get more spines in your fingers. And, um, so how do, we, how do we remove Choya? Yeah. Use a comb. You use a comb or a tweezers or um, a pair of needle nose pliers. So just FYI, don't use your hand because it'll make it worse. Um, okay. Um, we have cute baby animals. So, so what does anyone know who, what these are? Yeah, these are lambs. These are desert bighorn lambs. And um, they, again, you can find them in the park. Typically the lambing season, the lambing season occurs from uh, about April and June. So we don't have lambs right now, but it's all, it's right now it's mating season. So if you come now, you will get another kind of show. <laughs> Although I've never, I mean, if you're lucky, I've never seen that before in the park, but it, it is fairly easy to see sheep though. If you go to certain locations, particularly Borrego Palm Canyon, which is very easy to get to, you can almost always see a bighorn if you stick around enough. We have, and then of course, here's the endangered bighorn sheep. So that was just a follow up. This is a male. There are herps galore. Is anyone here a herper? If you don't know what that means, then you're not a herper. Um, a her someone who studies herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So we have a lot of reptiles and amphibians, is what that means. Um, an incredible array. It's really, really, they're really cool to see. Tons of lizards, um, tons of snakes, uh, lots of frogs, um, even uh, salamanders, right, during really rainy seasons. Breathtaking geology. So here's one of those photos that I promised you. This is um, the Badlands um, at sunrise, I believe. And um, this, and you can, you can drive through this, so you can kind of see the roads sneaking through that. Um, but you can also go to a really famous overlook called Fonts Point and just look down on this. And it really is, it really does take your breath away every time you see it. There's a place in the Badlands where you can see where the tectonic plates are crashing into one another. And so you bring up a good point that there's actually not one, not two, but three fault lines that run through Anza Brego and, and then the surrounding regions. Um, so, of course, the San Andreas Fault does run just north of Anza Borrego, um, but we also have the San Jacinto Fault. And there are places where you can go and you can actually see tectonic activity happening. You can see um, spreading, right, plates pulling apart, and um, you can't see it live, you know, 
action because it's very slow, but you can see evidence of it happening or uplift or um, slip, slip skirt plates. Um, yeah, subduction, right? All the different fun patterns. Do I need four wheel drive to you, they, Yes, thank you for bringing that up. You do. Um, so there, the, well, I'll come, I'll come back to this a little bit later, but actually many places in the park, you need four wheel drive. So you need a vehicle that at least all wheel drive, but most of the time you need four wheel drive because the roads are very sandy. So don't, um, so this is a really important, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, but you always want to know your, the capabilities of your vehicle, and it's always recommended to stop by the visitor center to find out what the road conditions are in that moment, because they can change day to day. Thanks for alerting me to that. And then, of course, stars for days. Um, so, like I mentioned, it's an international dark sky park, and um, this, of course, was taken over a period of several hours uh, from the visitor center. Um, but it's, it's not hard to do something like that if you have a tripod. We also have um, palm oases and lush riparian zones. So these are two things that go hand in hand. A palm oasis, uh, a palm oasis is a place where there's a lot of water that collects and then makes an ideal environment for the California desert palm, which, um, by the way, is the only native species of palm in California. So all the other palms that we see around the city are not not native, not from the United, the United or well, not from California. Um, the palms that you see in Anza Brego are native. They are meant to be there. And then riparian zones, meaning there's water, right? So there, during springtime and rainy seasons, you can walk to certain washes or streams, and it, they're raging rivers. It's crazy the difference between springtime when we've had a lot of rain versus summer, or even right now where it's not, it's not very wet yet. And then of course, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the art and the, the sculptures, the metal sculptures that you can find around Borrego Springs the out, or within the um, outskirts of the state park itself. So Brego Springs, like I mentioned, is a thriving community. There's a lot of artists there. And there's something, I think it's 160 metal sculptures around town um, where, that were commissioned by an artist, um, Ricardo Bersetta, that created all of these incredible sculptures. And this is, um, I don't know how tall it is, but you can drive and walk right up to these. And it towers over you. And there's all different animals and themes in these sculptures. Um, OK, so now that you know what's awesome about Anza Brego, I want to tell you how you can see it. Right? So what can you do in Anza Brego? So there's hiking, of course. And I, think some, I feel like some people came here wanting to know a list of all the cool places to go in Anza Brego. And I don't have that for you, I'm sorry. Um, because there's just so many cool places, and you can find that fairly easily on the internet. There's a lot of really great, great blogs out there where you, where you can um, search, you know, best hiking trails in Anza Borrego, and, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, but if you're looking, if you've never, well, you've all been there, but you haven't been there. A good place to start would be um, Borrego Palm Canyon is very easily accessible. It's very easy to get to and, and beginner friendly, but also beautiful. It's still very beautiful. Um, um, also, an interesting thing about hiking in Borrego is that we are a trailless park in the sense that there are trails, there are many trails, but you actually don't have to be on a trail to go hiking. Um, and you can, you can, as long as you stay on one of our dirt roads when you're getting out there and you know where you're going, you can go off trail, right? You can kind of wander. And of course, we ask for respect, you know, to respect the environment. Don't trample plants. Don't trample what look like burrows of animals. But so that's a pretty unique thing. Um, biking, of course. So there's there's over 500 miles of dirt roads that are great for mountain bikes and um, four-wheel drive vehicles that uh, many people take their bikes around. Were you raising your hand? No, okay. Um, 
four wheel driving, like I mentioned, so those same four, 500 miles of roads, you can take your off-road vehicle. Um, but again, there, there are rules, it's not lawless. It's not Ocotillo Wells, which is a neighboring um, uh, OHV, off-highway vehicle recreation park, is that what it is? Um, that is somewhat lawless. It's not technically, but it feels lawless. <laughs> Right? And so there are, it's, it's I've, I've actually never been driving in there, but I hear it's really fun, but there are people driving really fast and, and, and people get hurt a lot. Apparently there was a fatality last weekend, I heard. Um, so the state park, you can do some really cool off-roading and four-wheel driving, but you do need to stay on trails and you do need to um, follow the rules, which are staying under the speed limit of 25 miles per hour and um, making sure you know your vehicle. Um, and then of camp, oh yeah. yeah you Question. mentioned, uh, you know, the dark sky area. Yeah. Around Thanksgiving, as you're coming down out of the mountains, you see a glow, it looks like a city. Mm. And that's just southeast of the park. There's, there's thousands of people out there with their off-road vehicles. Yeah. And I'm surprised they don't have a, a field hospital. Out there. <clears throat> there are injuries and deaths out there. Yeah. Too. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and in addition to the glow that you mentioned, the light pollution, there's also a lot of dust pollution and sand pollution. So you can be, like, at the end of a weekend, so Sunday, because people have been driving all weekend in Ocotillo Wells, it puts all this dust and sand in the air, and you'll be in the state park, and it will look, it will look foggy almost, but it's really just sand in the air because of all the off-highway, off-road vehicles. Um, and then camping, of course, a really unique thing about Anza Borrego is that uh, you can primitive camp, you can camp almost anywhere in the park. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to use a, a distinguished uh, or a, a developed campground. We do have, I think there are five developed campgrounds within the state park, um, but which if that's your thing, they're great campgrounds. Um, but if it's your thing to just drive somewhere and then pull off the road and set up a tent, it's some of the most uh, peaceful and uh, pristine spaces that you'll camp ever. Um, and then RVing. So similarly, uh, most of the park, you don't have to pay to set up your RV. We call that, people call that boondocking, I hear. I've never done that, but this is what I hear. Um, and so you'll often see RVs kind of pulled off um, into off of the road. Uh, there's, and there's certain rules around how far off of the road you have to be. Um, and then, of course, wildlife viewing. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to wrap up because I think I'm almost, I'm almost out of time. Um, so right now is the desert season. Okay, so what does that mean? I mean, you can go you can go to Anza Borrego in July if you want, but I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it <laughs> because it's really hot. The temperatures can get up to 124 degrees, and it's dangerous. It's it's straight up dangerous, and it's not that pleasant. But come end of October into November, all the way through April, sometimes May, the, it's desert season in that the temperature has dropped significantly and it's really, really pleasant and beautiful. So right now is desert season. Um, now is the time that you should start thinking about coming out. So how to be ready for the desert. I'm just going to do this quickly because I think most of you already know this. But um, so always be prepared. And here are some ways to do that. Tell someone where you'll be. So either go with a buddy or tell someone where you're going to be if you go alone. Um, oh, I did it all individually. OK. OK. Cover up from the sun. So as counterintuitive as it might be, I, I put, always put on sleeves and pants when I'm going onto the desert, even though it's hot. Um, bring th recommended three liters of water per day. Food. Uh, fill up on gas, and there are gas stations in Brago Springs if you need to fill up. Bring a flashlight just in case you're out and you don't have, just in case you're hiking and you, and you end up being out there longer than you thought. Bring a paper map. Why would we recommend that? Yeah, there's no cell service in a lot of the park, and, and many times people go out um, without their paper map, and they're, you know, they try to find where they're going, and they end up getting lost or stuck. Um, so you always want to bring a paper map. Um, and then know your vehicle. So like I mentioned, most of the roads 
over 500 miles of roads that are sandy um, that you need to have four-wheel drive capability to drive on. Um, and then we always recommend people to stop by the visitor center. So they, they're really friendly. It's actually a really beautiful and welcoming visitor center. So stop by, talk to one of the interpreters, um, and then ask them about the road conditions, because like I mentioned, it can change. So if you're going to be doing any sort of serious hiking or camping in the backcountry, you always want to have um, a GPS system or a satellite system. Um, this is not to say that if you're just doing a day hike or a hike that is easily accessible, um, not everything in Borrego is like this, right? You don't have to hike for days. You don't have to go deep into the backcountry to see some of these incredible sites. So I just want to make that clear. But you can do those things, and we always want to make sure that people are prepared for the backcountry as well. Um, so Leave No Trace is an initiative that we partnered with. And all I want to call out is, it's pretty, in, pretty intuitive based on the name, is that there's a couple things that are unique to the desert. And one of them is, is camping on durable, hard surfaces. Um, fires, you can have a fire in the desert, but it has to be in a metal container. So you can't have a campfire just on the sand in the dirt. You have to have it in a metal container and you have to take all of your ashes with you. So it has to have a bottom. What, take what you burn out. And you want to buy your firewood there locally. And then the other one is in the mountains and in other places, you can, you can just go where you go. Like you can, you can pop a squat anywhere, right? What's unique about the desert is you cannot leave human waste behind, right? So no pooping in the desert and leaving it there, okay? Um, we, have, we sell something called wag bags in the store, and you can find them um, in most outdoor, play, outdoor uh, stores as well. And it's, it's like a portable little toilet bag, and they're super handy. Highly recommend it. Um, but that's the thing. I actually didn't even know about that. Uh, until uh, the last few years. So I always like to tell people about that. Okay. Um, okay, I just want to um, mention a few more things and then I'll stop talking and we can open it up for some Q&A. Um, but like I mentioned, one of our priorities in this day and age and for Anza Brego Foundation are our education programs. So this is just a, a, a short list, just tiny little list of the programs that we have running this season. Uh, if, if you don't know, if you haven't been out there in a while or you've never been out there or you want to bring people out there with some and join others, have some company, sign up for one of our programs. We do our best to make them affordable. So some are free and some are fee-based. Uh, but we do our best to keep them affordable so that, so that um, they can be accessible to a wide variety of audiences. So the, the State Park does have their own interpretive programs, which you can find on the State Park's website, and that's run out of the Visitor Center. And they have some really great programs at the Visitor Center and in Borrego Palm Canyon, which is right nearby. The neat thing about our programs is that we take people all around the park. So we have the, we have the capacity to go on hikes, drives, tours, retreats in many different locations all around the park. Um, you can look this up online, but this is our this is this has dates. So if you, I saw some people taking pictures. You could take a picture of this, but you just go to our website, theabf.org, and you can find our calendar there. Um, and then, last but not least, is some shame, shameless bribery with a cute kitten, a cute uh, mountain lion kitten that was taken in the state park. Um, we, do have, we do have mountain lions that breed there. Um, we are a nonprofit, and so the support of our community is what makes this work possible. So we always, you know, I always have to do my nonprofit plug, and that is to say that we always appreciate support from the community, and that could be in various ways. So that could be um, by joining an education program or following us on one of these places, Instagram and Facebook, or going to our website and signing up for the newsletter. Um, and then, of course, if you feel called, you can always donate money to support. Um, but everything makes a difference. And uh, we are really engaged and really proud of our member and constituent base. As a, a herper would say, right, is one of the best way to see reptiles is to drive slow with your headlights on 
but also just to keep an eye out for the, the reptiles and animals on the roads. And there are, there, animals do get hit by cars fairly frequently, including bighorn sheep, unfortunately. The best time to see reptiles would be probably in the summer, which is, which is not necessarily the best time to come to the desert. But if you're going at night, um, reptiles require higher temperatures. Um, so I think April through September is typically the season when people go out. Or, or like April, April, May, when it's not too hot, but it's getting warmer, you can still start to, you can start to see some. Well, which actually, like most, most people are afraid of rattlesnakes because of getting bitten, but do you know where the most, the, which location on the body people get bitten the most by rattlesnakes? Yeah, it's on their hands because they're trying to grab them. Um, as, as far as I know, tarantulas burrow underground in sand. Um, so I don't know if they're necessarily drawn to a type of cactus. I know that a lot of, a lot of uh, animals and insects are drawn to being around the roots of the creosote, which is one of our, another one of our iconic species that we have that's unique to Anzabrego. Um, but, but it's not a cactus. So the, the Sonoran Desert is a, an official desert type or region in North America, geographically speaking. The Colorado Desert is a, a man-made distinction or a, a district within the Sonoran Desert that's just designated by us, by oh. humans, um, based on, I believe it's the part of the Sonoran Desert that's west of the Colorado River. I don't know if any, if, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows better than me. But um, it's, so it's, it, it, there are some differences in, um, to, in topography and plant life that you'll find. But the Colorado Desert District, it's a district, right? So it really has to do with management. Um, and it's, the district is managed, it's headquartered in Borrego Springs in Anza Borrego, but they also manage other state parks, Cuyamaca and Palomar. So the question was, are there any trails that we encourage people to use and vice versa, are there trails that we try to discourage people from using because they're overused or destroyed? Yes, um, it depends. I think it depends on the moment in time. So right now, I don't, I know that for example, the, the slot, right? So the slot is a really famous location where you can, uh, you can hike around these um, essentially caves or slots, narrow spaces in, in rock and it's very, very overused. It's very popular. It's really cool, but it's really popular. Um, and so we don't actively, we don't tell people not to go there, but that would be an example of that where, yeah, it would be great if, if fewer people went there, um, but we're, it, it's not, we don't prevent people from going there. Um, and then in terms of trails we want people to go to, um, we don't have any priority trails like that, but typically we always direct people to Brego Palm Canyon because that's the easiest and most accessible and it's still really beautiful. But I, I'm glad you brought that up because it's something that we've been talking about with the park, about creating a series of videos for either or, right? For trails we want people to visit and trails we don't want people to visit and so they can just watch a video instead. We do have cryptobiotic soils, um, which are essentially micro communities of uh, bacteria and other microorganisms that live on the top layer of the soil. Um, yeah, we do, and so it, it, we always try to educate people about it, but at the same time, the rules of the state park are the rules of the state park. So. Um, yeah, I have, I have um, a couple books if you want to come look at it. This is one of the most definitive guidebooks, the Anzabrego Desert Region by Diana Lindsay, who is kind of literally wrote the book and is one of the most knowledgeable people about Anzabrego. And then um, a natural history of Anzabrego. So if you're interested in the natural history, history aspect. And then I have some business cards here if you want to reach out or if you want me to help direct you to some of our programs. I have a question. Yeah. We know we can go online and, and, and go to your website, the Anzabrego Foundation website, to learn more about the Anzabrego Foundation. Yeah. Do you still have an office in Borrego Springs? Yeah. And then, and then yeah. at the visitor center as well, or how does it? 
Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have our administrative offices in Borrego Springs in the mall. So it's it's a shopping center called the mall, um, right off of Palm Canyon Drive. Uh, so you can find the address on our website. Uh, but we also run the store in the visitor center and in the mall. There's a specific state park store. So everything that you buy there goes back to support our programs as well as the directly to the state park. And so you can find one of our staff at any of those places. Right. Good. Good. Thanks, John. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Excellent job. And by the way, Sam, in my book, you're an expert, so <laughs> you're pretty good. All right, well, thank you. Uh, excellent job. Thank you so much for the time. Really, really well done. Uh, speaking of well, Wild Wednesdays, um, on Wednesday nights is when we always do the Wild Wednesdays at Helix Brewing, except when we don't. And so uh, we have an author coming, a photographer that uh, has a new book coming out. Uh, his name is John. Uh, Show Walter, and he's going to be here uh, talking about the color. His, his book is called *The Living Colorado* or *The Living River*, and he's going to be here talking about and showing beautiful pictures of the Colorado River and uh, talking about uh, its beauty and showing its beauty and showing some of the threats as well. So that's going to be a fascinating talk. It's going to be on not, on Monday, not Wednesday. Monday, December. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> We had to do it on Monday, uh, December the 4th. So right here, December 4th, uh, 6.30, happy, no, not a happy half hour, but a, a meet and a drink. And uh, and then and then uh, he'll do his presentation at 7 o'clock on December 4th. It's a Monday night. So and hopefully we'll see all of you there. And thank you for being here. And thank you again, Sam. Excellent, excellent job. All right, thank you.